A day without Warmind news. That sounds pretty preposterous right now, doesn't it? What's up guys, Hownish here, and today we've got even more Warmind DLC stuff to talk about. In this video though, I wanted to talk about a few things. We've got a new interview from some of the Bungie devs about some of the activities. On top of this, we've also got a new trailer for Escalation Protocol, where we get some pretty interesting stuff, including a look at a new exotic, a new scannable, which appears to hint at the Queen's brother, secret code hidden in the armor inside of this expansion, and I want to take a look at some new seasonal items, ships, loot from Eververse, ornaments, and a bunch of other things, so let's jump into it. So the first thing to mention would be the new video from Bungie about the Escalation Protocol. They give us a lot of insights about how this event works, some stuff that we're going to see there, and you might spot a few very interesting items in there as well, so check this out. Escalation Protocol is continuing our emphasis on making the end game really, really fun and really, really rewarding. There were some things that the community has really been asking for that we've been wanting to address. One of the big things is challenge. When we decided we want to make that, we were like, oh, well, we should make this have both awesome waves of hard enemies and bosses. I felt like the Hive were actually perfect for this event because the Thrall are almost built to just come at you in waves. Warmind has a couple new varieties they put in, which actually really help. Yeah. Uh, we have knights that carry around shields that'll block your shots. On top of that, we have snipers. So in a way, it's kind of like Court of Oryx and Archon's Forge combined. This is one of our first events that actually uses the entire public level. And if a public event is supposed to happen while you're running Escalation Protocol, because you can trigger it at any time, the two will integrate together. Every playtest we got into, we went into it thinking, uh, if we can beat this, it's probably still too easy. We oriented all the events and the bosses so that once people have that strategy and they're executing on it, the more players and guardians that come in, that join in the middle, that engage in the event and help, the further it's going to go, the, the more ammunition they're going to have for that plan. So it requires some moments that people are shouting out at each other that are communicating about what their state is. And then you fail and you have to look at it and say, okay, what, what could we have done slightly differently to have gotten over that hump? You reorganize, regroup, swap your weapons out, and then go back in and try again. In a lot of ways, good design tells you players should be able to look at something and immediately comprehend what their goal is. And that's true, but there's also a part of design that's mastery. And you see something and you think, I don't quite get this, and you let your brain put together the pieces. And that was really interesting to tune for this event. So there's a moment we have to go clear some shadow rifts every single level of the event. There's seven levels in the event, and that gets harder and more varied over time. Once you clear one of these rifts, a uh, knight spawns with a sword. If you kill him, he drops his sword and everyone can grab it and run around with swords and it's the best. I love it. It's awesome. It's yeah. like, it's, is it the Krotos sword? Yeah, it's, it's from D1 it's, it's, that you pulled it's out? It's pretty much the exact same sword yeah. from, from D1 because that sword is just so much fun. Ben and I have, we worked together on D1 and we worked on, on DLC since then and on Taken King. This was the most fun I've had working on something here. I hope players like it because yeah. sometimes Having fun working on something does not translate to players liking it, but I think it will in this case. Yeah. We don't have the entire picture until the community gets their hand on it, until players actually start playing it and they start breaking it open and looking at the guts and yeah. you know telling us the ideas that we should have had. I know sometimes people might feel like it's not having an impact to continue to tell us what needs to be put into the game or what they think would make the game more fun, but it's that type of feedback that led to Escalation Protocol being developed in the first place. So obviously we see Hive and a bunch of new enemies in the area on Mars. One of the big things to point out here is that we finally see the Anna Bray weapon being held by a Guardian, and of course this gives us a ton of information. It's a very unique looking weapon. I spoke before about how I really hoped the scope would look kind of like what Anna Bray sees through her eyes in the cinematic, and it looks like that's going to be happening which is really cool. But we get a lot of confirmation here because if you look at the icon in the hood there, we do see it has a unique icon, so this is 
definitely an exotic weapon. On top of this, from the ammo inventory, we've got 14 rounds in the magazine, 52 in reserve. This is almost certainly a scout rifle. So obviously that's pretty strange because we've seen some footage that looks like an auto rifle, but we have seen different versions of the weapon, one with a darker skin, one with a lighter skin. So it's possible that this could be a kind of necrochasm style quest where you're sort of upgrading the weapon to some degree, or perhaps there are different states for it. But what we're seeing here is definitely an exotic weapon, almost certainly a scout rifle, like I said. So let me know your thoughts about that. Pretty exciting stuff. We see here what I believe is a new ornament for the Sunshot, a very kind of high focus looking thing. Really, really cool. Obviously, they talk about the Crota Sword and we can see that in action a little bit. And next, it looks like we also see a new ornament for the Telesto right there. Kind of blue weapon skin, which is pretty neat. So definitely some pretty cool stuff to note inside of this trailer. In particular, that exotic scout rifle looks really cool. Cannot wait to get my hands on that thing. It looks like it will be one of the kind of quest rewards for Mars. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. From the recent video about Mars though, we did see something pretty interesting. And this comes in the form of a scannable that we can see this warlock actually scanning here in the trailer. Now, if you take a good look at what they're actually scanning, it does of course appear to be a ship. But then if you take a better look at an awoken ship, what this appears to be is actually one of the top two wings of one of these ships. And then we can see the three kind of engines or afterburners, whatever they'd be called. And these are broken up on the ground beneath this wing. And if you take a closer look at the structure that we see in the cinematic and compare it to an awoken ship, you can see that they are very, very similar. And of course, this is very interesting. And a lot of you guys in the comment section, I saw some posts on Reddit about it. A lot of folks pointed out the possibility that this could indeed be the Queen's brother's ship. So of course, back in the Taken King, Prince Aldrin, the Queen's brother, was flying with the Awoken at the beginning of the Taken War. Obviously, Oryx launched a huge assault, which devastated the Awoken. And the Queen's brother, Prince Aldrin, was known to have crashed on Mars. So definitely a lot of links there. We can almost guarantee that this is actually an Awoken ship crashed into the surface of Mars. That doesn't necessarily mean the Queen's brother is going to be a character in the expansion, but I think we could be looking at some further hints to his whereabouts and some potential stuff that's actually going on. So let me know your thoughts about that in the comment section. Now though, I wanted to point out some interview segments between the PlayStation blog and some developers at Bungie about some of the endgame here. So PlayStation blog asked Bungie, what did the team learn from the response to Destiny 2's first expansion? Does the escalation protocol take this into consideration? And Ben Womack from Bungie responded, wow, did we learn a lot from Curse of Osiris? The Mercury destination feeling too small and how little players could progress when exploring, it was two lessons learned among many others. We took those lessons to heart with the Hellas Basin destination and with the escalation protocol. The event will send you around the zone it's triggered in, summoning intensely challenging waves in varied encounter spots. Unique and desirable gear is guarded by weekly rotating bosses at the end of the escalation protocol event. But it does also say other end game pursuits will tie into escalation protocol as well, giving players even more reasons to come back throughout the weekly reset. So on top of actually collecting the stuff from this event, they do confirm that other elements of the game, potentially quests, potentially bounty type things, they do use the word pursuits and of course they are bringing a bunch of pursuits in this new pursuit tab in the game. So it's really cool that some of this stuff is actually going to tie together and there will be quite a few different reasons to actually play Escalation Protocol. PlayStation said if up to nine players can participate, how difficult are these challenges going to be? Are most players going to be able to complete all waves? And Ben said, first of all, all of the waves in the event are near or at the level cap, meaning at launch most players will feel pretty underleveled. We expect players to believe something like nine players will be required and until they level up enough. Secondly, we've deliberately tuned Escalation Protocol to be achievable by the most prepared and coordinated max level three person fire teams for the Warmind expansion. Taking on this event with only three people is harrowing, but not impossible. So any additional fire teams who join the event will relieve the pressure on that core well-geared fire team to coordinate their strategy for any given wave. And finally, we believe most players will have the opportunity to complete the event if they can find another group to coordinate with. That's a big reason the event takes place in a public zone to give all types of players opportunities to collide with each other and tackle the event together. So that is actually a pretty interesting point. You know, this is an end game activity in a public space. So if you see a whole bunch of people doing one of these escalation protocols, even if you're a solo player, you can go and kind of tag along. Maybe they'll be higher level than you and kind of make it a bit easier for you actually to get a completion of this. They go on to ask how do different instances of escalation protocol differ? Will the enemies and bosses change? And will you be making adjustments throughout season three? And Ben replied, 
implies that the two public zones where players encounter Escalation Protocol have functionally identical versions of the event, though the terrain and encounter spaces will of course be different. We're trying very hard to make the presence and opportunity of the event feel constant, leaving the impression that it could be kicked off anywhere at any moment. As Season 3 progresses, a total of 5 unique bosses will rotate each week. After week 5, the first boss will rotate back in, just like the Court of Oryx bosses did from Taken King. So a few pretty cool insights there about Escalation Protocol. A couple of final things I wanted to point out, Bungie spoke about the Prismatic Matrix, and this has actually been something which has been a little bit confusing. Basically what it is, is a featured set of Eververse items. So there's 10 items in the pool right there, and the items inside of this matrix are actually earned through Prismatic Facets. Now you can buy Prismatic Facets from Eververse with actual money, but every time you level up each week you will earn a Prismatic Facet, and so when you turn the facet in to the matrix right here, you will obtain one item that you don't currently own, which is actually in this inventory. If you acquire any of the items in that inventory from Bright Engrams or Dust during the week, then it will knock them out of the list, so you'll never get duplicates from the Prismatic Matrix. But DMG confirmed players may earn one Prismatic Facet per week per account, and these stack up to three. If you don't see items you're interested in, you can save the activations for a future week. So if you own a featured item on a given week, it will be greyed out, and your chances for other featured items will be increased when activating the Prismatic Matrix. So basically it's a route to much more predictable stuff that you can get from Eververse. I think it's ultimately not designed to make things really obtainable in the first week or couple of weeks, but it's designed to kind of give you better chances of actually getting everything from the loot table, especially a few weeks down the line when you've collected a bunch of stuff, but there are specific items you still need, kind of giving a better opportunity to actually get those. But the last thing worth pointing out is that of course inside of this prismatic matrix screenshot we can see a bunch of season 2 items, an exotic ship, an exotic ornament for the Huckleberry SMG, we've got a new emote, other legendary ghosts, ships and sparrows, so it was just a little tease at some of that stuff. But on top of this we have seen a couple of other vanity things, we saw the new ornament for the Vigilance Wing. It also looks like in this clip right here there's actually a new ornament for the Skyburner's Oath, and this is a kind of pure black ornament, and we also see it kind of on this exotic preview image right here. Of course there will be a full suite of ornaments, all of the Eververse stuff that we normally have, Season 3 Iron Banner weapons, Faction Rally stuff, Trial stuff, all of those normal updates, so there is going to be a lot of content here. But guys, that is going to summarize this video, lots of stuff to talk about as always. But if you have enjoyed the video guys, a like really helps me out below. The amount of support recently has just been insane, I'm doing my best to keep you guys up to date with absolutely everything, and next week when the DLC drops, of course you can expect a ton of information. Bungie should be dropping the patch notes for the DLC and the May update about an hour before the DLC actually drops, so I'll try and get that stuff to you as quickly as possible, and then I'll keep you posted on everything else. But like I said, thank you guys for all of the recent support. If you are new to this channel, be sure to hit subscribe if you want to keep up to date with Warmind and the future of Destiny 2. It's going to be just over a month until we get all of the reveals for September content, so that's going to be pretty exciting. Again, I'll keep you guys posted on all of that stuff. For now though, I appreciate you watching. Whatever you guys do, I hope you have an awesome day.